What's up, guys? It's Friday, and so you know what time it is. Time for What the Fitness. Oprah's had a very public kind of battle with obesity, and her weight has fluctuated quite a bit over the years, and her diet has been the subject of a lot of different magazine articles and whatnot. It, it actually kind of makes me sad because she, like many other people, struggle with this and unfortunately has fallen victim to many of the fad diets out there. So uh, last I checked, I believe she was on a GLP-1 mimetic, I believe, like Ozempic or something like that. And she actually has lost some weight and appears to be keeping it off. So good for her. I apologize if I got that wrong, not looking to disparage anybody. I am for people who are obese having access to these medications. I do think that they're helpful. I think that people should also be doing lifestyle change along with it and not just doing the medication, but it does appear to help facilitate lifestyle change because it improves appetite regulation. So let's see what they have to say with that out of the way. Something in some people's brains that works differently than other people's brains. Your husband's brain is different than yours. Yes. Well, that's true. And we've seen those people who can eat anything they want and seemingly not gain weight. False. And then we're the adipose holders here. Adipose. Adipose. Yes. How do you spell it? A-D-I-P-O-S-E. Okay, so we're the, we, the adipose holders, know that if we looked at that apple, if I ate an apple pie at 11 o'clock at night, I would be two pounds heavier in the morning. It, it, there's just, I, I mean, so I can't eat, weighed two pounds. eat after a certain time. Yes. So when it comes to the national conversation around obesity, what are we getting wrong? I know you were a consultant for that movie, The Whale, which I thought was... So profound. Thank you, yeah. thank you, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Rachel. And once again, this conversation is such an important one. And actually, in answering that question, I want to add what we're getting right, right? right. Like, we're, we're having this conversation, and this is huge. And the whale, similarly, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction. And what we need to continue doing is having these conversations about the fact that obesity is a disease. Because one of the things that we're getting wrong is this idea that it is calories in, calories out. Oh boy, and like Dr. Fatima go. just said, it's not that for everyone. Yes, it's it that is. for some people, yes, it but is. it's not for others. And people that really struggle yes, with is. their weight, with their health and with obesity, it's not that. It's not about moving yes, more and you know eating less. Yes, it is. And that is what we have to change. We have to change that conversation change as we're what? doing here. We have to educate more people and raise more awareness about this. How are you raising awareness? You just talked in circles. You didn't actually say anything. You're like, it's not calories in, calories out, so we should have a conversation. Okay, let's sit in a circle, having a conversation about fucking nothing. Okay, so first off, I want to say that I have changed my mind on this over the years. I used to be of the opinion that obesity was completely the fault of the individual and it just meant that you were lazy or slothful. I no longer hold that opinion. There is evidence that our brains are wired differently, but it is on the appetite side and appetite regulation. We know that obese people have a stronger reward response to food. We also know that, for example, obese women are more likely to have sexual assault trauma in their past. So trauma, wiring, all this stuff plays in, but it's not because it is omitting the laws of thermodynamics. If you take in calories, if you take in carbons, your body has to do something with the carbons. If you don't consume as many carbons as you oxidize, your body has to get them from somewhere, your adipose tissue. Thus, if you're in a calorie deficit, because calories, it's the stored potential energy in the chemical bonds of food. Those bonds between carbons and oxygens, and nitrogen in the case of protein, and hydrogens, those bonds contain that chemical energy and the process of metabolism breaks those down and liberates those, that energy so that you can capture it as ATP. If you have too much, you store it as body fat so you can capture that ATP later when you might need it. But if you eat less calories than you expend, you have to liberate carbons to oxidize them in order to create that energy. This is not Lord of the Rings. This is not Star Wars. You don't create matter out of nothing. And having somebody with a PhD sit there and say, by the way, a psychologist, sit the down. I'm sorry, because this is not your area of expertise. Having somebody with a PhD sit there and say calories in, calories out, doesn't matter. It matters because in the human randomized control trials where people eat in a calorie deficit, whether they are obese or not obese, they lose weight. And in fact, 
people who are obese lose just as much weight as people who are not obese. In fact, if anything, people who are obese lose a little bit more weight. Take a breath, Mike. Take a breath. Oh. He died March 18th from a stress-induced heart attack. All right, all right. Not mad at Oprah, by the way. I'm mad at this expert. Are there differences between obese people and non-obese people? Yes. Obese people tend to have a harder time regulating their appetite, which is why things like GLP-1 mimetics can be a helpful tool for them. Additionally, people who are what's called obese-resistant phenotype do not have higher metabolic rates. Lean people do not have higher metabolic rates than obese people. In fact, the research shows that obese people and type 2 diabetics actually have absolute higher metabolic rates than people who are lean. When you standardize for lean mass, however, they end up being basically the same. If anything, obese and type 2 diabetes have a, still have a little bit higher metabolic rate. Please tell me how that fits in this whole theory of calories in, calories out doesn't work. It doesn't work because you can't handle the truth. Some people prefer nicely coded to actual truth. There is some truth to the fact that there may be what's called an obese resistant phenotype, but that is not from a higher metabolic rate. What it is from is people who overeat, who tend to be obese resistant, if they overeat, they actually spontaneously increase their physical activity without even realizing it. They pace more, they fidget more, and they don't realize it. People who are obese prone tend to not increase spontaneous energy expenditure. Again, I'm not saying that's their fault. It's not their fault. This is unconscious. It's not something you can do anything about. Your two choices are either consciously increase your energy expenditure to compensate for the fact that you're not expending as much energy or take in less calories. And that's where, again, some of these GLP-1 mimetics can come into play. But if you lost weight, it's because you were in a calorie deficit. If you gained weight, it's because you were in a calorie surplus. And this expert should lose her frigging PhD for saying insane shit like this outside of her area of expertise. It is unhelpful. It paints people as victims who can't change anything and it disempowers them. And I'm sick of it. Because what you're telling people is, oh no, it, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's okay. And that, it's fine. It may not be the person's fault. Also, you have no power to fix this. It's okay. Don't even bother trying because you can't actually fix it because you're a victim. Oh, you know what? That feels really good for your ego in the moment, but it disempowers the f out of people in the long term. And I'm sick of this. Shit. I'm out.